It's a passage dreamed of for hundreds of years. Even Columbus searched for it. But it took the greatest engineering feat in the history of mankind to create this bridge of water between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, the Panama Canal. Twice each year, in spring and fall, the stately ships of Holland America Line transit the canal. And when they do, they make a passage through history. In 1524, King Charles of Spain ordered a survey of the Isthmus of Panama to find the quickest route between the two bodies of water. Nothing came of it. Spain's claim to the land ended in revolts 300 years later. Soon, however, interest was revived, this time because of the California Gold Rush and the 49ers' desire to get from the eastern United States to the west, fast. That mothered the invention of the Panama Canal Railroad, built by Americans to take folks from ocean to ocean in three hours. But a water route was still an idea whose time had to come sooner or later. After all, a canal would cut several months sailing time from the long swing around South America's Cape Horn on a trip from New York to San Francisco it would turn an 8,000-mile sail around the Horn into a 50-mile shortcut across the Isthmus of Panama. It was the French in 1879 who decided to bank on their experience and make the cut. After all, Count Ferdinand de Lesseps had built the Suez Canal 10 years earlier, hadn't he? The French came and they dug, and then the rains came and flooded their hard-won efforts. To a degree, the French were stymied by the lack of technology. The machinery they needed just hadn't been invented yet. But they also fell victim to the tropics, and especially to malaria and yellow fever. The diseases and hardship took 20,000 lives by the time of the French pullout in 1889. In 1901, Theodore Roosevelt became President of the United States, and he wanted his country to hold sway over both oceans, with an American canal to connect them. Interestingly, most congressmen wanted to make the connection through Nicaragua. When a volcano erupted there during the 1902 debate, it pretty much decided the matter in Panama's favor. The Americans did not have much better luck than the French at first. Mudslides and disease overwhelmed the work and the workers. In fact, the first chief engineer and his wife, who arrived a year after work had begun, came with their own metal coffins in tow. Presumably, they left them in Panama when they returned to the U.S. in another year. The replacement was John Stevens, a rough-hewn man who had built the Great Northern Railroad through the Rockies. His expertise was welcomed, and his willingness to stop the project cold probably saved it. Army doctor William Gorgas believed that yellow fever and malaria were carried by a type of mosquito, a theory most thought outlandish. But Gorgas had proved it to his satisfaction, working with Dr. Walter Reed in Havana during the Spanish-American War. And Stevens listened to him. The area was a fertile breeding ground for these mosquitoes, so a massive cleanup began. Streets were torn up, then paved. Sewers were laid. 120 tons of insecticides were imported, then sprayed on stagnant pools of water. It was the most costly cleanup campaign in history. Then the work really began but not just on a canal. One of Stevens' great contributions was the construction of a vast railroad system to haul away the enormous loads of earth. It was a marvel of engineering in and of itself. Stevens also understood what the Lesseps had not, that a sea-level canal would never work, not in this land of rainy seasons and mudslides. 
He helped Teddy Roosevelt to see the advantage of a system of locks and a man-made lake that would actually take a ship up and over Panama. This would make friend of foe. By damming the Chagres River and letting the runoff from the seasonal rains fill the lake and locks. Man would do much of the initial work, but nature and gravity would keep it going. Roosevelt liked the idea and came down himself in 1906 to check the progress. It was the first time a president had left the country while in office. Among the things Roosevelt saw were the 95-ton steam shovels. This new invention was the workhorse that helped make the American effort a success. 50 to 60 shovels hauled 200 tons of earth each day. The workers were not just Americans. Many day laborers came from Barbados and worked six days a week for what was then excellent pay, 10 cents an hour for a 10 hour day. Most of the American workers did considerably better than a dollar a day. Top pay went to the steam shovel operators who made $310 a month for their work on these newfangled machines. Dynamite was used for the first step in creating Culebra Cut, later called Gaillard Cut. And sometimes in the 120 degree heat, the dynamite went off unexpectedly. One premature blast took 23 lives. Despite terrible setbacks, the work continued steadily. There was one unexpected interruption when John Stevens mysteriously quit in 1907. Roosevelt then appointed someone whose staying power was certain, Army Colonel George Washington Gerthals. Gerthals carried on the work with military precision. On May 20th, 1913, two steam shovels met and Culebra or Gaillard Cut, a nine mile canyon through the Continental Divide, was complete. The last concrete was poured at Gatun Locks, the locks on the Atlantic side, a few days later. On the Pacific side, two sets of locks were built, the Pedro Miguel and Miraflores. On August 15, 1914, the first full transit of the Panama Canal was made by the steamer Ancon. It's a project that has been described as the moonshot of its day. At the height of work in 1912, 50,000 people were building the canal. And when it was complete, at a cost of $352 million for the U.S., it came in under budget and ahead of schedule. One of the most luxurious ways to experience crossing the canal is aboard the ships of Holland America Line. The SS Rotterdam, flagship of the Holland America Line fleet, world famous, world class, a world unto herself. The MS Noordam and sister ship MS New Amsterdam, sleek and technologically advanced without losing any of the charm and graciousness of luxury cruise ships. And our newest addition, the MS Westerdam, one of the most elegant ships on any sea. Four of the most magnificent ships to sail the world's oceans. Sumptuously appointed, with spacious lounges, outstanding restaurants, cozy corners, and some of the largest staterooms afloat. Floating art showcases with treasures that are the envy of the world's art collectors. Yet these elegant ships are comfortably suited for casual relaxation. This is the way to see the Panama Canal. Each spring and fall, our ships make ocean-to-ocean -ocean cruises with varying itineraries lasting from 10 to 21 days. In the spring, our ships depart from Fort Lauderdale and Tampa, Florida, and New York City on a westerly route. In the fall, our cruises leave from beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia for their annual eastbound crossing.
you can embark or disembark at a number of West Coast ports. The eight to ten hour voyage through the Panama Canal from the Atlantic to Pacific or in the reverse direction goes through the heart and history of one of mankind's most amazing hard-won feats. Through locks, up 85 feet onto the largest man-made lake and across the continental divide, then through another set of locks and into a different ocean. Electric locomotives pull the ship along and specially trained canal navigators pilot all ships, even warships. Water flows in and out of the lock chambers through a system of culverts and cross culverts. Electricity for the locks comes from generators at the dams. 53 million gallons of water are required to move each ship through. But the water is in endless supply as long as the rainforest remains intact. Oddly, you're actually making a north to south or south to north voyage. Stranger still, because of where the entrances lie, the Atlantic entry is really farther west than the Pacific entry. And another curious twist. Because of the lay of the land, Panama is the only country in the world where the sun rises over the Pacific and sets over the Atlantic. It's a fascinating adventure in this land nine degrees above the equator. A Holland America Line canal cruise is more than just the passage through, no matter how awe-inspiring that is. Each trip includes the sunny delights of the Caribbean and exotic ports of call. Cartagena, Colombia, where you'll step into Spanish history and the charms of centuries-old architecture. Or you might discover the San Blas Islands, home of the fascinating and colorful Kuna Indians. Another exotic stop is Puerto Caldera in Costa Rica, where you can ride through verdant jungles and visit a coffee plantation. In Acapulco, Mexico, you'll witness the fearless high divers of La Quebrada, who plunge into the surf from jagged cliffs high above the ocean. Farther north on the Mexican Riviera, the beautiful beaches entice you to think of nothing but the unhurried pleasure of the moment. Back on board ship, Holland America Line's choices for the active life are plentiful. Or you can choose to do absolutely nothing at all. The selections for dining are abundant throughout the day, all prepared under the care of expert gourmet chefs. And always our gracious Indonesian and Filipino staff is attentive to your every need. And while you relax, surrounded by fine art, entertained by first-class talent, feasting on delectable meals with a host of amenities and unequaled service, at the helm of your ship are our highly skilled Dutch officers, proud heirs to a 400-year-old seafaring legacy. The Panama Canal, it's the cruise of a lifetime. A passage back in time through the hopes and struggles of thousands of people for hundreds of years. Let us take you on this voyage through history in a style once undreamed of, on one of the elegant ships of Holland America Line. Now this is the way to see the Panama Canal. Don't you agree? <laughs>